Absolutely. It's a small crowd, so I can do that. When you're on live stream. Right. Okay. All right. Okay, you should you should lead. Okay, yeah. You know, you, you, traditionally you start at eight after. Test one, two, three. Test, test. Test, test, one, two, three. One, two, three. Test one, one, one. Is that working? Okay. Prova, prova. Uno, due, tre. Good evening. I'm Celia Harris, and on behalf of Father John Uni, pastor of St. Cecilia Parish, Scott McDonald, director of Faith Formation, and the members of the Adult Faith Formation Commission, welcome to this very special night with Brother da Guy Consolmagno, director of the Vatican Observatory and president of the Vatican Observatory Foundation. There will be a journey shared with you this evening, one that began in 1952 in Detroit, Michigan, and after following different pathways, led to an appointment at the Vatican Observatory. There has been much accomplished during the years in between, including bachelor and master's degrees earned in planetary science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology just across the bridge in Cambridge in 1974 and 75. A PhD from the University of Arizona in 1978, and then a return to Cambridge as a postdoctoral fellow and lecturer at the Harvard College Observatory, and beyond that as a postdoc and lecturer at MIT. His next path in 1983 was the U.S. Peace Corps, where he served for two years teaching physics and astronomy in Kenya. Following his return to the States, he taught at Lafayette College in Pennsylvania, entering the Maryland Province of the Society of Jesus in 1989, and professing vows as a Jesuit brother in 1991. Studies in philosophy and theology would follow in Chicago, and then on to his assignment at the Vatican Observatory in 1993, where in 2015, he was named director by Pope Francis. There have been publications, books, and awards throughout Brother Guy's journey, too numerous to list this evening but one highlight. In 2000, he was honored by the International Astronomical Union for his contribution to the study of meteorites and asteroids with the naming of Asteroid 4597 Consolmagno. The AFFC would like to thank Father John, Scott McDonald, and the St. Cecilia staff for their assistance with this evening's presentation. Brother Guy's visit has been made possible through the collaboration with the Cathedral of the Holy Cross, and we extend our most sincere gratitude to His Eminence, Cardinal Sean O'Malley, Monsignor Kevin O'Leary, Father Robert Kickham, and the Cathedral staff. 
a special shout out to the Center for Astrophysics team at the Harvard College Observatory, who so kindly welcomed Brother Guy back for a special visit there last night. Following Brother Guy's talk, the floor will be opened to questions and answers. For those of you present, please use the index cards provided and pass any questions to the end of your pew on the main aisle. An AFFC member will collect them from you. For those of you who join us on the live stream, please use the chat function to send on your questions. We'll do the rest on this end. Please include your name and where you are joining us from this evening. Please plan to join us downstairs in Fellowship Hall after the talk for a book signing, apple cider, and cookies. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Brother Guy. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. So it was about 15 years ago. I was working with a colleague at Northern Arizona and another professor at uh, the University of Oklahoma. We were using the Vatican's telescope which is on a mountain east of Tucson, Arizona, on the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope. Fabulous telescope. I could talk for hours just about the design of this telescope. We had been using it to look at trans-Neptunian objects, these little objects out beyond Neptune that originally were just nothing more than dots of light, and the thing is to measure the colors. So you look at them in three or four different colors. We had discovered that of the ones we could see with our telescope, there were a bunch that were deep red and a bunch of them that were absolutely colorless gray and nothing in between. This is telling us something, but we could only see the brightest ones. So we applied for and got time at the Keck telescope, largest telescope in the world in Hawaii. Now the way you get to use the telescope is once they've decided you can use it, they'll give you the plane ticket to fly to Hawaii. But you can't actually go to the telescope because it's at uh, 15,000 feet. And it takes you know, a couple of weeks to get acclimated to the air. So you have one night, you stay in a little village. In those days, it was Waimea in, in the big island, halfway up the mountain. And you would actually be in this village, which is kind of cool because you're observing from the village. You can go out to the McDonald's next door, get, you know, get your midnight snacks, and do your observing, and then go home. So, we show up, we've got a night's observing all planned, we've flown all the way from the mainland. We talk to the people at the top of the mountain by a, a you know, special link, and they said, we're not gonna open up tonight. It's snowing up here. You look out the window, and sure enough, there's a cloud over the mountain. We drove straws, one person stayed up all night in case the weather improved, never did. And the other two of us, well, it was our one night, we're going to bed. Next morning, I realize it's Sunday morning. I'm a good Catholic boy, but I'm a brother, I'm not a priest. I can't just roll out of bed and say mass. So I figure if there's a McDonald's in town, there's probably a church in town. And I look up, sure enough, there's a church. They're having mass at 8.30 in the morning. It's Sunday morning. I walk over to the church. But this is Hawaii. It's full of tourists. So the, before the Mass, the pastor goes out, do we have any visitors today? You know, a few people raise their, and where are you from? Oh, Massachusetts, welcome. And, and where are you from? Oh, Ohio, wonderful. And, and every person introduces who they are and where they're from. And I'm the last one. So I stand up and I say, hi, I'm an observer from the Vatican. <laughs> I'd waited years to be able to use that joke. What does it mean to be an observer from the Vatican? Why does the Vatican have telescopes? Well, the first question is, of course, why does anybody have telescopes? You know, telescopes are not going to make you rich. They're not going to make you famous. They're not going to get your girls. It didn't work for me anyway. Why does the Vatican have an observatory? Why does anyone want to be an astronomer? I'll tell you my story, because I think it's, it's part of, of what, what this all comes from. I was a Sputnik kid. I was, you know, starting kindergarten when the first uh, Sputnik was launched. 
I was a senior in high school when people landed on the moon. Every smart little boy in those days was going to go into science, not the girls, of course, heaven forbid. Stupid. Well, by the time I got to be ready to go off to high school, to the Jesuit high school in Detroit, I was all set to be a scientist. I had you know, all the little science kits that you had in those days. My own chemistry lab set in the, in the basement. And then I, when I got to, to the University of Detroit High School, I found out all of the smart kids did classics, old-fashioned people that they were. So I did not go into the science track. I went into the Latin, ancient Greek track. Andra moyena pamuza polutrapanos malapala plonkte epion tori. I could, you know, recite the, the opening lines of the Odyssey at one time. Not anymore. So I finish four years, and now I've got to figure out where do I want to go to college. Well, my dad's from Boston, family from Medford. I'd been out here. I knew Boston was a great place to go to school. I didn't know what I wanted, but one of the thoughts in the back of my head was to be a Jesuit, because Jesuits wore black stuff, and they were really smart, and people admired them, and heaven knows I wanted to be thought of as being smart, and I wanted to be admired. But on the other hand, maybe I could be a lawyer, like my grandfather had been. Maybe I could be a newspaper man, like my dad had been. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I figured if I went to Boston College, that would be Boston and Jesuits, and I could study any of those things. So I show up in BC. Now, I don't know what college was like when you were in college, but in 1970, the local liquor store delivered to the freshman dorms. <laughs> now, I remember there was a guy in one of these Friday evening parties who had had an entire bottle of rum and a can of smoked octopus and was stumbling down the hallway trying to figure out where to be sick. That was kind of the level of what the, the freshman dorms were like. And after a few weeks of this kind of behavior, he, he eventually found a place. I won't go into the details. It's gruesome. It involved taking his trousers off and putting them over a trash can. No, never mind. Anyway, after all of these geniuses are, you know, flunking their classes for acting like this, as far as I was concerned, you know, alcohol tasted like mouthwash and was expensive, and you could take that money and buy chocolate with it. What was the point? And then they'd come and they would pour out their problems to me because they were failing their classes and life was unfair. And the more they would complain to them, the more I'd think, you know, life is tough when you're stupid. <laughs> what do you expect? You're an idiot. I couldn't stand living in the freshman dorms. Um, so, and, and the girl I was curious about when I'd met there my first year was dating somebody else. So. Yeah, obviously there was no future left for me. So I went and found a Jesuit and said, I'm ready to sign up. I know you're desperate, you'll take anybody, here I am. And Father Healy looks at me and he goes, son, have you prayed about this? I'm 18 years old, who prays? You know, come on. Go to your room, close the door, and ask God well, I kicked my roommate out. He was the one who was dating the girl that I'd been interested in. Close the door. I'm sitting on the floor looking at the ceiling. Here I am, God. I know I'll take anybody. I want to go. I'm supposed to be doing this. And I'm waiting for the voice from the ceiling. And nothing is happening. And I'm feeling really foolish. While I'm waiting, a question pops in the back of my head. What does a priest do for a living? I mean, Sundays I see they get up and they tell everybody else how to live, I can do that. But the rest of the week, what do they do? You know, I guess they must have desks, right? Do priests have desks? Do they have offices? There's papers on the desks? What are those papers about? They're about people. People with problems. People just like the idiots I'm trying to get away from! <laughs> this would be the worst job in the world for me to sign up for. And at that point I realized either there is no God, which is why I have not heard of anything and therefore it would be stupid to be a priest, or there is a God 
and he just told me it would be stupid for me to be a priest. Either way, the answer was the same. And then the question is, okay, if that's not what I'm supposed to do, what am I supposed to do? Well, what do I want to do? Where am I happy? Nobody had ever asked me that question before. But somehow the question, where am I? I'm happy visiting my old friend from high school who's now at MIT, where they've got weekend movies and pinball machines and tunnels you can explore and the world's biggest collection of science fiction. Why don't I just transfer there? Remember when I was a little kid and I was going to be an astronaut or something? I look in, what does it take to transfer? You have to fill out a bunch of forms, you have to go for an interview, you have to get accepted. You know, the odds were pretty, pretty tiny, but let them tell me I'm not good enough. I don't tell myself that. I go to the interview. The guy says, why do you want to come to MIT? I can't tell him it's to read science fiction. I know that's not going to fly. So I have to come up with a, with a story. I go, I was the editor of my high school newspaper, which is true. I'm going to be a science journalist. That was the flavor of the week that week at MIT. They spent the rest of the interview trying to convince me how important it was for me to come to MIT. Then they said, what major do you want? And I'm going, I'm not going to be an engineer. The only thing I can make with a hammer is noise. And I'm not going to be a physics major. I know that. You know, I'm a history major. I never even... Then I saw the major Earth and Planetary Science. And I saw the word planets. And I thought, that must be astronomy. I have no idea what an astronomer does for a living. I'll become one and find out. <laughs> Little did I know that I was actually the geology department. Little did I know that that was the department that was most desperate for students and most likely to take transfers. They let me in. I show up and I'd find out that I'm supposed to be studying geology. What could be more boring than rocks? There's a rock, sure enough. There's another one. <laughs> what do you do? Then there was a professor who taught a class about rocks that fall from space called meteorites. You can touch other planets with your hands. You can study things that have been untouched for four and a half billion years. And he was such a dynamic professor that I would wake up on Tuesdays and Thursdays and say, I get to go to meteorite class. I mean, I had been a nerd, but never that much of a nerd. Um, I actually tried doing a little bit of science journalism. It turns out you, 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 it's hard to find good science journalism, and I found out why it's really hard to do. <laughs> but I found out I was pretty good at doing science. And they shuffled me off to get my PhD at, at Arizona. And I, oh, Tucson was just not the place for me. Cowboys and Indians wasn't my thing. And I like, you know, water and, and lakes and that's desert there. And it's, and it's full of old people, you know, people the, the age I am now. So I said, well, I'm never going to come back here. I want to live in Boston. I really got to like Boston. Uh, I had a wonderful restaurant, you know, the Ken's at Copley. I'd hang out there all the time. Uh, there were wonderful ice cream place, Steve's Ice Cream. None of these places exist anymore, of course. And so I got a postdoc at Harvard, another postdoc at MIT. If you're in the academic world, you know five years of postdoc means you couldn't get a job. So I'm in the big leagues. I'm a utility infielder, but I'm in the big leagues. But that Jesuit education that had been, you know, dagging me along would cause me to lie in bed at three in the morning and ask, you know, Guy, why are you writing papers about the moons of Saturn when there are people starving in the world? Going back to the very first question, why does the church have an observatory? Why does anybody have an observatory? Why would anybody waste their life doing something as useless as astronomy? And I had no answer. So finally, I said, well, the heck with this. I'm in good health. I don't have any debts. I don't have any responsibilities. Good thing none of those women ever wanted to marry me, you know, so I don't have little kids to worry about. I'm free to do whatever it is I want to do. What do I want to do? 
I'm pushing 30 years old. It's finally time to do my last wild adventure before I get old. So I joined the US Peace Corps. And I said, I'll go anywhere you want me to go, do anything you want me to do. And they sent me off to Kenya. And I said, I'll do anything you need in the country. And they sent me to the University of Nairobi to teach graduate students astrophysics. Which I thought was kind of, you know, pointless in Boston. Why would it be pointless in... And there were, you know, reasons I was teaching the guys who were going to be the teachers to the teachers to teach the teachers who will go into the schools. And, and yeah, that was, there was a usefulness. But really, what happened was I was there with a group of 80 other American volunteers. Most of them in the real Peace Corps. And, you know, we're living in mud huts where there was no windows in the windows, no black in the blackboard. And I could come up in the weekend, see what the Peace Corps was really like, and see what Africa was really like. I brought my little telescope. Oh, did I mention I had a little telescope? Of course I had a little telescope. I'm a nerd. I had the H.A. Ray book, The Stars, so I could see what the stars looked like from the Southern Hemisphere. And I had my little telescope. And I'd set up the telescope in the village, and everybody in the village would come out and look at the moon through the telescope, and look at Jupiter through the telescope, and look at the rings of Saturn. How many people here have ever seen the rings of Saturn in a small telescope? How many of you have ever seen the rings of Saturn in a small telescope and not gone, oh, wow? Because that's what human beings do. That's what my friends back in Michigan did where I was growing up. And then they wanted to know what was NASA finding out. And then they wanted to know what are these things we're looking at. And then they wanted to, could we do that? Could I study the moons of Jupiter? Could I be part of this big conversation? And it finally hits me. You know, I had a cat in those days, very clever cat, much better at being a cat than I could be. But my cat never wanted to look through the telescope. Human beings look through telescopes. Without the chance to think about and wonder about and care about bigger questions than what's for lunch, if you don't have the chance to do that, then you're nothing more than a well-fed cow or a cat. This is what makes us human. We don't live by bread alone. I think I'd read that someplace. They taught me why human beings do astronomy. The opening of Genesis is the creation of the universe. Most people think that chapter one is about the creation of the universe. It actually isn't. It's about the creator of the universe. Because Genesis is not a science book. It's a, it's a book about God, not about a book about human beings or a book about creation. But it's interesting how it starts. In the beginning, God said, God's already there when the story opens. Before there is a universe, there is a God. Therefore, God is not part of the universe. This is different from every other religion you'd find in the Middle East, where, you know, they thought the gods were fighting among themselves and the world was created by accident. No, this God is outside of creation, and only by being something outside of creation can creation have a meaning. Wittgenstein gives the example of a, of a chair. A chair does not have meaning in and of itself. A chair only has meaning because you are sitting in it, because you are not part of the chair. The universe only has meaning if there is something supernatural. And that's what Genesis starts with. God says, let there be light. Now, we're not talking about the sun and the moon. Those don't come until the fourth day. The light means that everything in creation is done out in the open, so you can see. Nothing is hidden. It's accessible to all of us. The order in which things are created are a very logical order, and the universe is made in an order as logical as day follows night. 
And every step along the way, God says, this is good. There are religions out there that are not going to tell you that. There are religions that are going to tell you that the universe is evil, the physical universe drags down your spirit. Chocolate is a lure of the devil to give you all acne. But my religion says that chocolate is a creation of the good God and a foretaste of the joy of heaven. And it's a sacramental experience to have a good piece of chocolate. And what is the ultimate goal of creation? Where is it all going? And the Babylonian myth that was, you know, creating the city of Babylon. That was the best they could come up with. To the Jewish people, it was the Sabbath. The day when you no longer worried about filling your stomach, and instead you looked at creation. And you celebrate it with dance, with poetry, with music, even, dare I say it, with astronomy. Feeding your soul in glory of the Creator. Do you see why maybe doing astronomy is something that a church might be involved in? There's three religious beliefs you have to have before you can do science of any sort. At least three. These are the three that come to mind. You have to believe the universe is real, that we're not just a bunch of philosophers, you know, butterflies dreaming that we're philosophers, or philosophers dreaming we're butterflies. But no, the physical universe actually exists. You have to believe that the physical universe makes logical sense. If you believe in Zeus throwing lightning bolts, there's no point in doing science because there's no way you can predict what Zeus is going to do. But if you refuse to believe in Zeus and you're saying, no, the only God is the God outside the universe, then you've got the story of Genesis saying it makes sense and we human beings ought to be able to figure out how that sense works. Logic is a tool, not only a tool given to us, but logic is sacred. Remember that Greek I learned in high school? One of the bits we learned was the opening of the Gospel of John, in archaea to logos, in the beginning was the word. The Greek word for word is logos, the same word that we use for logic. In the beginning was logic, in the beginning was reason, and reason was with God, and reason was God. That gives you a great impetus to say, yeah, maybe I can use this reason to understand the universe. And the third thing you need is the belief that the universe is worth studying. When you have a culture that believes in the story of Genesis as its story of what God is like when he was making the universe, not what the universe was like, that changes, but the picture of God doesn't change. That means if you're Jewish, or Christian, or Islamic, a Muslim, people of the book, you have the societal and the cultural wherewithal that you can go ahead and do science. So that the Christian church in the Middle Ages could build universities where you could study things like music and arithmetic and geometry and astronomy, the four courses of the quadrivium. Indeed, you were expected to study those before you could go on to get your doctorate in theology or philosophy. An old way of doing studies, of course. Nobody goes on and gets you know, doctorates in philosophy. Wait a minute. Jack, what's your degree in? It's a PhD. Mine's a PhD. We have a few other PhDs in the room. You know, it doesn't stand for piled higher and deeper. Doctor of philosophy. We wear these funny black robes when we get our degrees we're still direct descendants of the medieval universities founded by the church to explore the universe, not just in a way that's going to make us rich, but in a way that's going to make us spiritually rich. There are so many connections between astronomy and, and theology, starting with the fact that so many languages use the same word for sky as for heaven, cielo in Italian. One of the things that you, you see used in Genesis, that you see used in, in, in societies, is the calendar. There is 
the calendar based on where the, the seasons are going to be, which is important if you're planting and harvesting. There's a calendar based on where the moon is going to be, which is important if you're on the sea and you're worried about tides, or you're a hunters and gatherers and you want to know when's the moon going to be full and you can go hunting at night. And then the Romans mashed these two calendars together so that the length of a month, a month, if you will, got stretched to fit the solar calendar. The Jews had a completely, a very wonderful calendar where they'd throw in an extra month every three years or so to make sure the days filled out. And then within the month, the month, there are seven days in a week. Today's Tuesday, seven days ago was Tuesday, seven days ago before that was Tuesday. How far back in time can you go and seven days back was always a Tuesday? And the answer is, we don't know, because that chain goes back to re before recorded history. At least, you know, starting with the Babylonians, so we know they had it. And the seven days of the week, well, today's Tuesday. Tues, what's a Tues? It's, it's a Norse god of war. And tomorrow's Wednesday, Woden's Day, you've heard of Woden. And the day after that is Thor's Day, you've heard of Thor. You've all watched the Marvel movies. I don't have to explain who these characters are anymore. And the day after that is Frida, the goddess of beauty. Well, of course, if you know Spanish or French or Italian, you know the days are Lunar Day, Marta Day, Mars Day, Mercola Day, Mercury Day, <clears throat> Jove Day, Jupiter Day, Venner Day, Venus Day. And then we have Saturn Day, Sun Day, and Moon Day seven days of the week because there are seven things in the sky that move backwards against the stars. This connection between calendars is also how the church itself got involved because the Romans had come up with this marvelous calendar that matched together the months and the years and they said every fourth year we're going to throw in an extra day because that way the days of the months and, and the first day of spring will be pretty much on, on basis. And that's true. It only drifts by about one day a century, less than one day a century. But of course, by 1500, it drifted by 11 days. They had to fix the calendar. In addition, around 1500, something else was going on. You want to determine when is Easter? Easter is the first Sunday after Passover. When is Passover? Passover is the first full moon of spring. When is spring? Spring is you know, the, when the day and the night are the same length. Okay, what if, what if Sunday and Passover are the same day? Is that that day is Easter or is it the Easter after? Arbitrarily, they said, we'll make it the, the, the Sunday after. Okay. And that kind of worked out, and there were mathematical ways you could sort of calculate. Until you now have people traveling to India and to China and to the America. And what if it's Sunday in one part of the world, but Saturday in a different part of the world? Now what do you do? Furthermore, what if you're far enough away that you want an easy way to calculate the seasons because you're a missionary in Peru? How do you do it? The two big problems, the Council of Trent met and ordered the Pope to hire some astronomers to figure out how to fix it. Pope Gregory XIII did that, and they came up with a couple of very clever fixes. Number one, to fix the problem of the, the year drifting, they said that every fourth year will be a leap year, just like now, except a century year. 1700 is not a leap year. 1800 was not a leap year. 1900 is not a leap year, except in Excel, uh, Microsoft Excel, where they screwed it up. Don't trust dates before the current date in Microsoft Excel. It screwed up. If you remember the year 2000, it was a leap year, because every fourth century year, 1600, 2000, 2400, those will be leap years. And that's good enough that it set the calendar for easily 10,000 years, maybe more. So we don't have to worry about that fixing, you know, fixing that anytime soon. As far as working out the date of Easter, 
rather than trying to calculate where the moon is going to be and all of this and all of that, somebody came up with a nice short formula that you could fit on one page that kind of gets it right. 16 years out of 18. Maybe it's 17 years out of 19. Close enough. Because it doesn't really matter. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So if we send people off to Mars and they want to celebrate Easter, as long as everybody agrees when we're going to celebrate Easter, that's fine. And of course, they set this up so that it would be as close as they could get to the, the calendar that had been set up in 313 at the Council of Nicaea, back when the Eastern Church and the Western Church were still talking to each other, and they thought, well, everybody will agree with this. Of course, that hasn't happened. But that's when they hired astronomers. One of the guys they hired was a fellow named Christopher Clavius. Clavius was a Jesuit mathematician. He was the guy who said they should teach mathematics in all the Jesuit schools. Um, as an old man, he wrote a letter of recommendation to a young upstart named Galileo who was looking for a job. They named a crater on the moon for him, if you ever saw the movie 2001. The moon base is at Crater Clavius. And after him, the Jesuit college in Rome continued to teach astronomy because it's a thing that human beings were fascinated with. They were the astronomers who would then say to Galileo, yeah, but what about this? And wait a minute, we saw that first. And Galileo got into a big political fight because Galileo was ornery and he was selfish and he was self-centered and he was, you know, always looking for a fight, which is to say he was an Italian. You know, what, what's unusual about that? Um, incidentally, everything you know about Galileo is wrong, but the truth doesn't make the church look any better. It's, you know, there's a chapter about it in my book. To come to the end of the story, after Galileo, the church was teaching science, the universities were teaching science. Science was being, what is the actual day-to-day -day life of a scientist? It's gathering data, it's sorting data. You know, you used to write it on three by five cards and sort out you know, this kind of leaf there, that kind of leaf in that pile. Nowadays we use Excel spreadsheets but it's handling data. What do you call this sorting and filing of data? It's really clerical work. Why do they call it clerical? Because it was done by clerics. Because it was done by people who were running parishes, keeping tracks of births and deaths and marriages. If you look at the science publications of the 1700s. The Vatican Observatory, back in 1935 when we had new quarters and suddenly a lot of space, the Vatican libraries dumped on us all of their modern books on astronomy. Modern, I mean printed with a printing. So we've got a complete set of the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society, going back to volume one, number one, 1665, with papers by Newton in them. And you look at who's writing papers in the 1700s, and you find it's either wealthy men, medical doctors, or clergymen. Very occasionally women. Why those three? Because they're the only people who have the education and the free time to do science. But a third of the papers are going to have the reverend so-and-so. If the church is against science, then how come all the scientists are reverends? You know, if the church was against science, then you would think that there would be a big split between science done by atheists and non-science. I got in my pocket a cell phone. The cell phone has a charger. The charger has limited, you know, the charger will run under the, so many volts and so many amps. Where does the word volt come from? An Italian named Volta? Good Catholic. Where does the name Amp come from? A Frenchman named Ampere, who was not only a good Catholic, but instrumental in founding the Society of St. Paul. So, so. What makes people think that they're atheists? Who invented genetics? Gregor Mendel, a monk. Who invented the Big Bang Theory? Georges Lemaitre, a Belgian priest. 
Who was the first person to take spectra of stars and planets? Angelo Secchi, a Jesuit who used a telescope on the roof of the St. Ignatius Church in Rome. Over and over, who was the first person in the United States to get a doctoral degree in computer science? I don't remember her name, but it was a Catholic nun. Somebody here may be able to help, help me out. Keller. Keller. Keller, that's right, that, that's right, Sister Keller. If that's the case, you know, who's selling you the idea that there's a war between science and religion? Because obviously this idea doesn't arise from the data. It's got to come from somebody with an agenda. And I can find a couple of people. In, in 19th century Europe, there was great anti-clericalism. And so they would use, the science is going to solve all our problems, now we don't need religion anymore. Yeah, and science solved all of our problems into World War II. In America, there were books on the eternal war between faith and religion, meaning in particular the Catholic religion, because we had to keep those people with vowels at the end of their names out of the country. People like my great-grandfather. They're gonna ruin the place. And so they said, well, we all know the church is anti-science, and science is going to be our salvation. Therefore, we have to keep these people who belong to the church away from America. It was an anti-immigrant deal. Nastier than that, what else was happening at the end of the 19th century? Eugenics. Eugenics, which was based on a terrible misreading of Darwin's idea of evolution tied in with social Darwinism. I'm rich and you're poor, and that's only natural because I'm naturally superior to you, so I shouldn't even help you. You know, if, if, if this was a rational society, we'd get rid of people like you, but then there'd be nobody left to, to clean my house. That was the mentality going on then. And the only, pre -pill, the only people who spoke out against eugenics were the church. Therefore, people said, ah, the church is obviously anti-science. Well, it was anti-bad science. In the 1890s, Pope Leo XIII was faced with two interesting problems. Number one, this is the time when people are starting to say that the church is against science. But number two, this was the time when the Vatican had been reduced to the area just around Vatican City, around St. Peter's, and the Italian government claimed it was really part of Italy and they were just being nice to mar not march their army in and capture the Pope. And the Pope said, no, Vatican City is an independent country. And he gets the idea from a fellow who had worked with Father Angelo Sacchi, the guy with the telescope on the roof of the church, to form a Vatican observatory. And this would do two things. It would show that the church was literally supporting science by having a building that supported the telescope, by having the money that would pay for astronomers. And it would also show that we had a national observatory that was participating in international programs along with other national observatories and therefore the Vatican was a nation. And it worked. They joined an outfit called the Carte du Ciel where they were photographing the sky. Every national observatory in Europe was given a piece of sky to photograph. The Italians were given one piece of sky. The Vatican was given a different piece of sky. And starting in 1891, they started photographing the sky. By 1929, the director of the observatory there was 83 years old and he died. The Italian government signed an agreement with the Vatican saying, okay, we admit you're a separate country. The Pope was then faced with, what do I do now? Do I continue the Vatican Observatory? Does it still have a value? Yes, it still has a value to show the world that the church supports science. And because they were given this, you know, the, the land back, including the Pope's summer home out in Castel Gandolfo, the Pope built a couple of telescopes on the palace, put people in the telescopes, hired a bunch of young Germans who started a, a, a laboratory there. And from that point to today, we continue to do science. Now it's a cool thing, I'm gonna end with, with two last bits. 
First, the science we get to do. As you hear from my story, I was 20 years you know, living on NASA grants, working at universities. And when you're on the NASA grant cycle, you gotta have results before the grant lands up. Three years, you better have results or you're not gonna get your grant renewed. If you're on the tenure track, you certainly better have results after six years or you're not gonna get tenure. At the Vatican Observatory, we can do projects that may take 20 years to come to fruition. Surveys, thankless projects, but everybody's gonna use the data because nobody else is able to take the data. I started working when I arrived at the Vatican Observatory. I entered the Jesuits in 1989. In 1993, they sent me to Rome under obedience. I couldn't teach like I wanted to. I had to go to Rome and eat that terrible food. But they had a thousand meteorites. Meteor Remember meteorites? Remember I was telling you about meteorites and how excited? I now have a thousand meteorites that I get to measure any way that I want. And I can create the data that I used to need back when I was a theorist. In addition, we've got people doing surveys of stellar types. We've got people doing surveys of peculiar stars. We've got people who are taking images of nearby galaxies to compare against the images made by the Webb telescope and the Hubble telescope of distant galaxies. Long-term survey projects that people are gonna be using for the next 50 years, but nobody else, you know, the first time I presented my data on the meteorites, a grand old man of the field said, Guy, why are you doing that? Nobody does that. That's why I'm doing it. I get to do science that nobody does. But there's another reason why I'm doing the science. And for that, I'll go back to my childhood. My dad um, grew up here in Boston, went to Malden High, went to Medford High, went to Medford High. He did not go to Malden Catholic because it opened a year late, too late for him. So he went to Medford High, uh, went to Tufts, my grandfather, who had been an immigrant kid, went to Boston English and BU and became a lawyer. My dad goes to Tufts, uh, can't get a job, so he's working at uh, his great uncle's restaurant, the Amalfi Restaurant, which was around the corner from, uh, from the, the Symphony Hall. The owner, his uncle, says, eh, it's not good enough that I'm training my own kid. I've got a friend who's got a restaurant up in upstate New York, so I'm going to send you up to upstate New York. He's going to send his son to me. We'll train each other's kid. So my dad is in the middle of nowhere, upstate New York. The owner of the restaurant says, I'm going to hire some, uh, some waitresses from the local teacher's college. What are you looking for, Joe? And Joe goes, short and blonde. That's mom. <laughs> After the war, they move out to Detroit. He was a journalist. He got a job working in a paper out there and eventually working for Chrysler. And like anybody in Detroit, we had a summer home up in the lakes. And I remember being 10 years old, sitting in the summer cottage on a Sunday afternoon, and it's pouring rain. Can't go out to play. So mom, short and blonde, pulls out a deck of cards, and we're playing rummy. And it suddenly hits me, as sometimes it does when you're 10, and for a moment you're like almost rational. And I'm going, wait a minute, she's a grown-up, I'm a kid. Why is she playing with me? It's because she loves me. And you can't tell a 10-year-old boy, son, I love you, because the boy's going to go, mom. But this was her way of telling me she loves me. And when I'm in the laboratory playing with my meteorite data, I'm thinking, why is God playing with me? Because he loves me. Because every time I manage to figure something out in the puzzle of the, the physical properties of meteorites, I can hear, you know, <clears throat> Abba, Daddy, upstairs going, yeah, yeah, isn't that cool? Let me show you the next one. Because doing science is an act of worship. And it gives me that same jolt of joy, tiny little jolts of joy that you get in the best moments of prayer. That's why the Vatican has an observatory. That's why I was a postdoc here 40 years ago, a parishioner in this parish, where incidentally I found a plaque that says, 
men die, you know, missing in action in the, in the Great War, and there's my dad's name. They found him. That's why I'm back here now to share with all of you the utter joy of finding God in the universe, like St. Ignatius tells us too, of remembering what St. Paul said, since the beginning of time, God is revealed in the things that he's made. And that's why there is no more religious act that I could do. Lord knows I'm terrible at taking care of human beings. But I am good at puzzling out the presence of God in the physical universe. And that's my way of being able to worship. Thank you all for coming. So I tried to limit myself to 45 minutes, which I think I did. We stood about five minutes late. We've got almost that much time for questions, and I hope you've written your questions down. There's enough of you that rather than calling on people, we're going to have Celia collect the questions, and uh, if you've got a good one, then she will read it to me. And keep the, you know, we'll pass through more than once, so if you don't have one now, and I'm going to sit down. Anybody over on that side who? Guess not. Okay. So, take a look at them. See if you can find a, a stumper for me. There is a book which will sell downstairs called, you know, Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial? And some of the other questions that they, I was going to say some of the other stupid questions, but they're actually not stupid. Questions that people ask us. So we'll see, we'll, we'll try to find questions that are not already covered in the book. Yes? First question is, how does the Vatican Observatory decide what to work on? How does the Vatican Observatory decide what to work on? There are a dozen of us. We all have PhDs from the big name colleges in the universe. Um, we've got you know, one guy from Oxford, one guy from Padua, um, a fellow from Munich, my doctorate's from Arizona. Um, each of us comes to the observatory with a PhD and a background in some corner of astronomy. And we're encouraged to build on what we have and the colleagues we have so the individual astronomers are free to work on whatever they want to work on. When I arrived 30 years ago, the director then, Father George Coyne, gave me very specific instructions. He said, do good science. And that was it. That means we get to do the kind of science that we've always wanted to do, but nobody would pay for before. Can an atheist do God's work? Absolutely. Atheists are wonderful people. I'm almost an atheist myself, you know. I only believe in one more God than Stephen Hawking. And that's, you know, not just a joke, it's an important point. There are many, many ideas of God out there that I do not believe in. I don't believe in Zeus. I don't believe in uh, the, the nasty God who's going to punish me if I do, a, you know, get out of line and do something wrong. To be an atheist, you have to have a really sharp, clear, perfect idea of who God is before you know that you don't believe in them. And the God that most atheists don't believe in, I don't believe in either. So, you know, when I, when I see a teenager saying, oh, I don't believe in God anymore, I'm not worried. Number one, I know that doesn't stop there. But number two, the picture of God that we had when we were little kids, maybe was it wrong, but it was certainly incomplete. And you need to be able to say, oh, there's more to it than that. Not that everything I learned was wrong, but that I wasn't ready to understand what God was really like. Does science need religion? Does science need religion? Well, I think it does. I, I pointed out the three bits of religion that you need to be able to do science. There are religions that don't think the universe is real. That kind of religion has a hard time doing science. 
There are religions that think that everything is the arbitrary whim of, you know, pagan gods. Can't do science with that. So you need a certain kind of religion to do science. Above and beyond the fact that you hope you have something of a conscience. But you don't actually need religion to have a conscience. And not all religions give you a conscience. So that, that's some, some people sometimes get confused about that. But simply the philosophical underpinnings that says doing science is a worthwhile thing for human beings. And more importantly, you can go home to your mom and say, I want to be a scientist and mom will be proud of you. Not all religions are going to give you that either. But you need that or else you're not going to have science happening. If God exists outside the universe, where does God exist? And the answer is, it's not aware. That's the whole point. That's like asking the Big Bang, what is it expanding into? It isn't expanding into. It is expanding. Um, I'm reminded of, of something I, I've heard that, you know, the, the Trinity and quantum theory are very similar. If you think you understand them, you don't. And so if that boggles your mind, good. I would hate to believe in a God that didn't boggle my mind. There'd be something wrong with that picture of God. So the follow-up to that is, well, what created God? What created God? Of course, that implies a time. There was a time there was a God. There was a time there was a no God. But we're talking about a God who is outside of time. So the question doesn't mean anything. If you had a God who was created, that wouldn't be a God worth believing in, you know. Not by my mind. A little bit more about the George Lemaitre, the guy who developed the Big Bang. George Lemaitre, <clears throat> Catholic priest, got a math degree from Louvain, um, you know, fought in World War I, as a lot of people did, was fascinated with cosmology, was fascinated with Einstein's theory of relativity. Uh, Einstein was not a great mathematician. He was a great visionary. He had learned mathematics from a fellow named Minkowski. Minkowski heard about the theory and then said, oh, I can express this with mathematics, which allowed everybody else to do it and, and, and work on the, the, the theory of it. So Lemaitre is looking at the, <clears throat> this theory and recognizes that there is a problem if space-time can be warped, and the warp of space-time is what we call gravity, or gravity is what we call the warp of space-time, and there's an infinite universe that existed forever, then why hasn't all of gravity not warped itself into one central mass? You got an infinite amount of time, it should have happened. It didn't happen. Einstein knew that was a problem, and he invented something called the cosmological constant, which was a fudge factor. It said, eh, just stick that in there and it stops it. And it's not elegant, but it'll do the job. Lemaitre said, if you have as a starting condition that the universe began at a quantum singularity of infinite energy, it would expand, the space and the time would expand with it, it would appear as if the universe was expanding, though in fact every piece of the universe would be standing still. It just would look like the, the space, well, not every piece of the universe, every, not every star, every, not every galaxy, every cluster of galaxies where its own gravity holds it together, and then a different cluster of galaxies where its gravity holds it together, and the space in between is growing with time because of the initial energy of the universe then we could explain why the universe is the shape that it is. And this was highly objected to, especially by a fellow named Fred Hoyle, atheist from England, who hated the idea that the universe would have had a beginning because that sounds too much like Genesis. And Lemaitre is going, no, no, it's just what's in the equations. Lemaitre worked for a while with Arthur Eddington, one of the great uh, mathematicians and cosmologists. He was the guy who observed the eclipse that showed that Einstein's idea of bent sp space was correct. And Eddington promotes and, you know, and, and introduces uh, Lemaitre into the world of astrophysics and sends him here to Cambridge, 
where he worked at Harvard College Observatory but actually got a degree from MIT. So he has two bachelors. Hoyle still hates this job. So he gets on the BBC radio in a popular program about astronomy and he refers to his own theory which explained all these things and then Father Lemaitre's Big Bang Theory. Hoyle invented the name to make fun of Lemaitre's theory. Lemaitre and Hoyle finally get to meet each other at a meeting of scientists at the Vatican in 1957. And once they meet, they became best of friends and went on vacations together and just, you know, for the rest of their lives, we're, we're delight, delighted with each other. And eventually, Hoyle's theory was good enough that it could be tested compared to the Big Bang, and Hoyle admitted his theory failed the tests. The Big Bang won. Um, do you believe in portals? Portals. Um, I believe that there are great science fiction stories you can write about portals. Uh, what we know about how the universe works makes it really, really hard to figure out how they might work, but, you know, if a famous scientist tells you something's impossible, wait a while. At the observatory, in, uh, about 19, in the early 20th century, in order to make life simple, the Vatican decided it wanted to have an observatory, but where are we going to get the scientists? We'll have the Jesuit order find the staff. The Jesuit order had a lot of universities. It was the largest men's order. They were the, had the best possibility of finding scientists to staff the place. Um, the difficulty is the Jesuit order are only men. The advantage is we all live under the same rule. We, all the money goes into one pot. So even though they're not paying very much, you know. If you remember the, the old phrase they used to call dinks, dual income, no kids? We're like, you know, twinks. We're like 12 incomes, no kids. So we can survive in what the Vatican's paying us. We're all living in the same community, but we're all men. In order to have an opportunity for lay people, for people of other orders, for women, to work at the Vatican Observatory, George Coyne about 30 years ago invented a category called adjunct scholars. And these are scholars who already have a job someplace else, but want to be affiliates of the Vatican Observatory. They can you know, put Vatican Observatory among their credits when they publish papers. They can use our facilities. They can use our telescopes. They can use our laboratories. They can use our libraries. At the moment, we've got a dozen of them, and I think we have four women among that group at the moment, uh, maybe three of the fourth coming in. The most recent addition is uh, a young Italian woman. You have to be approved by the, the Vatican. You have to be a good Catholic, Catholic in good standing. And uh, she comes from a little village that you've all heard of, San Pellegrino, the same place as the water. Her parents had barely a high school education, but she got a doctorate. She is now working at Stanford in the big experiment looking for dark matter. And she's a member of Communion and Liberation, so she's a good Catholic. And she's delighted to be a part of our observatory. We have an Italian woman. Uh, we have a woman at, uh, <clears throat> who's a historian, Ileana Canici, who's an expert on the history of astronomy. Um, a chemist at Bryn Mawr, uh, Michelle Franzel. And there's a fourth woman who's about to join us. So we're bringing women into the group. Plus, we have summer schools. Every two years, we bring in 25 students from around the world, and the only rule is you have to be really good at astronomy, looking like you're going to be a professional astronomer, and no more than two from any country. But beyond that, um, two-thirds of them are from the third world. Tuition is free. We're looking for donations to help support the school. Chris Kennedy is in the back of the room. He'll tell you all about donating to help support the school. Um, We've never had a gender requirement, you know, of quota of any sort. From the beginning, it has been at least a third women. The last couple of schools have been majority women. So that's how it works. <laughs> right. 
There's a great temptation about, you know, this dark matter, really consciousness, or the dark side of the force, or however you want. You, you do know that, that duct tape is the force because it's got a light side and a dark side and it holds the universe together. Um, it's really tempting to say, here's one thing we don't understand, human consciousness. Here's another thing we don't understand, dark matter. Maybe they're the same thing. Probably not but we don't understand them. I'm very, very wary of trying to say this thing is the existence of God or that thing is the proof of God or that other thing is God's thumbprint because it's all thumbprint. Existence itself is evidence for the existence of God. And beyond that, if you try to narrow it down more, you're narrowing God down and you're making God too small. Okay. From a scientific standpoint, do you think there will be an end of the world? Do I think there will be an end of the world? Well, if you mean planet Earth, oh yeah. We, we're, we're pretty clear about how that's probably going to end because we have seen other stars and we know how they end. Is there going to be an end to the universe? If you extrapolate from what we know now, yeah, probably. But the one thing I know about science and extrapolation is that extrapolations never work. We're pretty good at talking about the origin of the planet Earth and the origin of the solar system and even the origin of the universe because we have data from the past that we can use to constrain our theories. We have no data from the future. So all we can do is speculate. Now, speculation is a lot of fun. It makes you ask questions like, what is the meaning of life? If you think the meaning of life is to be famous, what good is your fame when, you know, the earth is nothing more than a cinder? If you think that the meaning of life is to be rich, what good is your wealth when, you know, it's your crazy nephew who winds up spending it all? These are good questions to ask. But beyond that, there's speculation that might provoke questions, but are not going to have like answers in the back of the book kind of answers. Um, do, you believe that there is life on other do I believe that there's life on other planets? That's the right question. It's a belief question because I don't have the data. But I have to make a decision as a director of an observatory. Some of, somebody comes to me and they says, I want some money to start this experiment that will allow me to explore whether or not there is life on Mars. And I sound, you know, it sounds like good science and even if you don't find anything, we'll learn something. Yeah, I have enough faith in the possibility that there might be life that I'll spend some resources looking for it. If you come to me and you say, I'm really into UFOs. Can you buy me a good camera and I'm going to go hunting UFOs? I don't believe in UFOs for the simple reason that we already all have good cameras and we haven't come up with any better pictures than we had 50 years ago. I could be wrong on both of those things. And that's the whole point of belief. I could be wrong. Uh, at the moment, I sit on a panel of the SETI Institute, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, on their science panel, not because I think they're gonna find intelligent life, but because I think that they can do really good science that will help us understand how life works. And incidentally, it would be really foolish if it turns out there was easy to find intelligent life and we just never found it because we were too, too shy to look for it. So I'm happy to look, but the real answer is let's find out. Let's look, because I don't know. That's the exciting stuff. Can you talk about the theological questions that emerge for you with the Webb telescope images and discovery? I can, you know, <clears throat> are there theological questions that arise from the Webb telescope? Here's a theological question. Why did God make the universe so beautiful? Didn't have to be. Logical, I can see. It wouldn't work if it wasn't logical. But why is it that it's all so beautiful? What does that tell you about God? There is a theological question. But the best theological questions are questions like that. Um, who is the first theologian? Mary. 
Remember, she's coming back from the temple with the 12-year-old Jesus who has just confounded her and she's trying to figure out what the heck is going on. When she gets back home, what is, she, she does not write a three-volume treatise on Christology. We're told what she does is she ponders these things in her heart. And that's what you do with questions like that. You spend time pondering them rather than thinking, I'm going to get the answer in the back of the book. The best questions are the ones that don't have the answers in the back of the book. What is the most exciting discovery you have? Okay, think of a couple of exciting things that I found, but one of them is hard to explain, and I think maybe three people in the world care about it. I'm measuring meteorites, and I'm measuring different physical properties just because I can. Then you sort of compare, of all the meteorites, you. Uh, the grain density with the magnetic susceptibility in particular, I put those sets of data in my computer and and all of these types of meteorites are gathered together and then all of that type and all of that type. One meteorite does because it turns out we had not classified it right. That just made me happy. Did it profoundly change the universe? Absolutely not. But it was just one of the cool. Let me show you the next one. Uh, there was another time we were looking at these trans-Neptunian objects, these objects out beyond Neptune. And where the object should have been, there's a little dot in the telescope, but then there's a cloud of light as if it had a coma, as if it was a comet. But it's out beyond Neptune. What kind of stuff is going to turn into a gas? And it's not surrounding the dot, it's separated by the dot by a little bit. What the heck is going on? Well, we took three images, and of course the images we were embarrassed to show anybody because there was the object and the cloud of, and then across the other image, the shadow of the leg of a moth that happened to be caught in the camera when we took the image. <laughs> and it was April Fool's Day when we took the image. Then we found out that a friend of mine in uh, JPL, his, his postdoc, had also seen the same thing a week earlier, so we sent all of our data to him. And they're still arguing about what it was. In other words, science is not tremendous, oh my gosh, big things. It's lots of little things that give you little bits of joy day by day by day. And that's what keeps me showing up in the lab every day. The DART program, yes. I don't know. I, I'll tell you about it. <laughs> Does mankind have the obligation to defend itself from acts of God, such as a serious asteroid? Ah, if, if God's sending an asteroid to end all life, who are we to stop him? Grief. God gave us the brains to be able to deflect an asteroid. I think he would be really ticked off if we didn't use them. DART is, was, a, the, the, <clears throat> was a really clever, clever idea. If there was an asteroid that was actually coming towards us, you don't want Bruce Willis up there to blow it up into smithereens. For a very simple reason. The Earth is really tiny in space. And even as the asteroid is coming close, there's probably still a 50% chance that it's going to miss until it's really close. But if you blow it up, you spread it out and you go from a 50% chance that it's going to hit to a 100% chance that half of it will hit. That's worse than what you did before. So instead, plus, asteroids are not nice rocks that you can blow up. They're piles of rubble, they're piles of sand. If you put a bomb inside them, all you do is you compress the sand. It could care less. So instead, what you want to do is to hit it from the side and knock it just a little bit off course so it misses. Doesn't have to be knocked much because the Earth is really tiny. How much is enough? Well, let's hit a couple of things and find out how much it takes. And that's what they did in a very clever experiment that it would take me another 10 minutes to explain. But in the process, we learn a little bit more about how these asteroids are put together. And that's important for other reasons. Yes, it helps us figure out how to deflect them if they're gonna end life. The odds of an asteroid ending life anytime soon uh, are not zero, but they're kind of small. If you're worried about death from an asteroid, 
two things I would recommend. Stop smoking and wear your seatbelt. <laughs> but this, this experiment tells us something about how the asteroids are physically put together, which tells us something about their history over the last four and a half billion years, which then you know, gives us a sense of what was going on when the planets were formed. And that's just a cool thing to know. In addition, knowing how asteroids are put together has a usefulness if you want to go up there with a bucket and a spade and shovel up some of that stuff and turn it into processed materials. You've got all the metals of the world sitting up there for free and 24 hour a day solar energy that you can you know, use this. Space mining isn't gonna happen tomorrow, but it will happen. And the first step is to have a really good idea of what these asteroids are, where they are, what they're made out of, how they behave if you're working on their surfaces. And that program went into all of those, you know, steps in trying to answer those questions. Can you please elaborate magnetar? Magnetar, I can't. It's, it's, <clears throat> I, I work in planets which are about as small and close as you get. Magnetars are astro, astrophysical entities far, far away from anything I've studied. And so I know enough to say, I don't know. Great question. Look up in Wikipedia. <laughs> What does it mean to be made in the image and likeness of God? Because this comes up if we're worried about aliens, you know. Uh, if they've got 20 tentacles. I think you can find this implied, at least, in Aquinas and his definition of the soul as intellect and free will, which means an entity that is aware of itself and aware of others. Others exist, knows that it exists, and is free to make pieces, to steal from the others, to love the others, to hold love from the others. If you've got an entity like that, it doesn't matter if it's in a computer, or a creature with 27 tentacles. In that case, in relationship with us, and probably it could par and ponder, come from just, you know, what laboratory made me, but oh, what so um, the apostles creed says the resurrection of the body what do you make of that and in what form do we if we're good live on ah i don't know in what form we live on i'll be interested to find out but the resurrection of the body is really interesting um I don't know who first said this. Somebody said it might have been Maritain. Certainly not original with me. You compare the death of Socrates with the death of Jesus. And the, the comparison he made, Socrates says, oh, I can drink the poison. What the heck? My soul's going to live on. My body doesn't mean anything. That was his religion. Jesus sweat blood because the physical body was so important to him. In fact, if you read scripture, you do not find the word soul anywhere. You'll find spirit, but you won't find soul the way the Greek. It's a Greek idea. It's a really useful idea. There are some ability to understand. But then another not just stuck around in this sack of flesh waiting so I can go off and have fun like an angel. I am the body that God put me in. I am the me that's in this body. This body matters. No pun intended. The physical universe matters. In some way, it's important that I respect my body and in, in, you know, integral self, other people's bodies and selves, the physical universe that we're living in. The whole point of the ecology movement is best summarized in Laudato Si 
as a crime against the ecology is a sin like a sin against God's will, God's creation. But especially rich, who wrote, uh, you know, the ancient Greeks thought that God was our mother, this ferocious mother. But Francis, St. Francis says, it's our sister. The earth, the universe is our sister. And as Chesterton says, even a little dancing sister that you can laugh at as well as love. You don't dominate your sister, you don't let your sister dominate you. Except when I was small and my big sister, but that's a different story. I love you, mom and sister. Um, we have to treat this physical life as if it matters. And we can't ever lose sight of the importance of this physical entity, which is the meaning behind the resurrection of the body. How that actually happens, I don't know. If I had a religion that I understood, I wouldn't trust it. I'm running out of energy and we're running out of time. I'll thank everybody for being a part of this. At this point, I would recommend that uh, my friend Chris is in the back. If you sign up to learn more about the Vatican Observatory, go to vaticanobservatory.org. If you sign up, give you a calendar. And if you go downstairs, we've got goodies for you. And the conversation goes on, and you can find the plaque that was once in the back of the church here with the men of the parish of St. Cecilia's and find my dad's name on there. Anything else I should be saying? Okay, the, the stairs are in the back. See you downstairs. I know you to figure out who I am. Oh, yes, yes. Okay, that's why you're familiar with that. That's right. And now